Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and oh, today I am so glad that you're joining me here. This is episode number 310, and today's topic is so very important, and it really touches my heart to be speaking about it. In just a moment, I'll share an interview I did with Kevin Hines about it's okay to talk about suicide, finding safety and hope amidst pain. I'm going to tell you um, a little more about Kevin before that interview gets started. First, I just want to thank my latest supporter on Patreon, Richard Widmark Jr. Richard, thank you so very much for stepping forward and making a monthly contribution to help keep this podcast on the air. I really appreciate it. And along with you, Richard, all the other supporters who've been making small contributions every month and helping me finance this podcast. It also helps me not have to have sponsors and advertising on the podcast, which I think, from my opinion, at least makes it easier to listen to. And so I'm really grateful you're helping me avoid having to go that route to get the bills paid. So I appreciate that very much. Um, Also, just... um, an announcement that's relevant to today's topic. I am planning to do a two hour workshop on suicide and the aftermath of suicide. Um, Right now, tentatively, I'm looking at September 11th as the date for that workshop. I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Pay, stay tuned and pay attention in future episodes because I'll come back with more information about how to sign up for it. And um, I'll, I'll have the details all worked out about the date and time. But I just wanted to plant that little seed in your mind to tune in to future episodes so you can learn more about that workshop on suicide. So with that said, I, I want to talk to you a little bit I, about this interview before it starts, partly because Kevin Hines is extremely busy and he only had a short time to give me for this interview, though I was extremely honored that he was able to take time out of his schedule to talk to me at all. So we didn't cover all of the topics that I wanted to, but we had a little discussion before and after the interview. So I'm going to share with you some of the things Kevin told me there, uh, just to add a little more uh, information to this, to the content for today. And so to begin with, one thing to know about Kevin, and we do discuss this, he, he tells us a lot about his backstory, which helps us really understand how he ended up in a day in September in the year 2000 on the Golden Gate Bridge, making the decision to take his own life. And Kevin survived his jump from the Golden Gate Bridge. He's one of only 36 people to survive that fall in, into, um, in, into the water from the Golden Gate Bridge. His story is really miraculous when you hear all the details about it. And he does cover it briefly in our interview, but uh, I wanted to just emphasize a few parts of that. He tells us that instantly when he left, his hands left the railing, he knew it was a mistake and he regretted what he had done and began to pray that he wouldn't die, but he assumed that he would die. Um, He hit the water and he tells us that he was confused. He didn't know for sure where he was or what was happening. Um, Still assumed that he would die. But this miraculous thing happened. A seal, a sea lion, a seal began swimming around him in, in continuous circles. I think that created a little eddy that helped him stay afloat in the water until the Coast Guard could get to him and pull him out of the water. Also, a woman driving across the Golden Gate Bridge saw him jump and called her friend who works for the Coast Guard who was on duty that day. That's why the Coast Guard was able to get there so quickly. And then also... The surgeon, the spinal surgeon, um, happened to be in the hospital the moment he arrived at the door so they could take him to the uh, the operating room very quickly to start to repair his injuries. So there were these um, 
little miracles in a way that conspired to keep Kevin alive. And he told me he's one of only five people who has jumped from the bridge and survived who has not had ongoing issues and and injuries to deal with. And so his whole story is really miraculous. And he has responded to that story by becoming a global speaker about the topic of suicide and mental health. And his story has inspired people all around the planet. Um, He does this public speaking. He has a YouTube channel with over 300 educational videos. He might, I think he said he's actually up to 500 videos now on YouTube that he just records and puts out there for people to watch, to give people hope who are thinking about suicide and to tell his story and also to talk about various subjects around mental health and wellness and, um, and developing resilience. He has created a documentary film, Suicide, the Ripple Effect. He's working on a couple of other documentaries as we speak. He has also worked tirelessly since his suicide attempt. He told me this before we started recording to get the railing on the Golden Gate Bridge raised because at the time he jumped, it was only four feet high. And he's been campaigning to raise the railing to make it much harder for people to to jump off and also to have a net installed under the bridge so that anyone who does jump or fall at least has the potential of being saved by a safety net under the bridge. And he also told me that is has just now been approved and work will be underway soon for these projects, raising the railing and putting the net under the bridge. Um, he's creating a documentary called The Net about this very movement. So that's something that will be coming out in the future, too. And we didn't get a chance to go into that in the interview, which is why I wanted to mention it to you now. Kevin has spoken to colleges and universities, high schools, corporations, clergy, military audiences, clinicians, health and medical communities, law enforcement organizations, and various industries. So you can see he's extremely busy. He's on the go all the time. He's received word from thousands of people who have let him know that his story saved them from suicide. So he's making a huge impact around the world, helping people who themselves are considering suicide, but also spreading the word and encouraging all of us to talk more about suicide so that it's not this silent stigma that we carry around in our society. Um, Kevin was featured on CNN in an interview with Dr. Sanjay Gupta. In 2016, he received Mental Health America's highest honor, which is the Clifford W. Beers Award for his work. He has also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Council of Behavioral Health, the uh, Voice Awards winner from SAMHSA. The U.S. Veterans Affairs awarded him their Achievement Award, and he has received over 30 U.S. Military Excellence Medals as a civilian. So... Kevin's been doing this work ever since he recovered from his own suicide attempt. He he just works tirelessly. He's on the go constantly. And I'm so, so very grateful that he gave me his time for this interview. So I want to direct you to his website, kevinhinesstory.com. Go there. He has a shop. I just bought a sweatshirt that says it's okay to talk. And one of Kevin's taglines is be here tomorrow. And I love that thought. I love that. Be here tomorrow. Um, Just stay one more day with us. Be here tomorrow. So you can find some of the merchandise he has with those those logos and inscriptions on them. You can link to his YouTube channel and just check out his documentary, all the amazing work he's been doing, oh, including his book he has written, which is Cracked, Not Broken. 
Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Attempt. And I will leave a link to the book in the show notes, links to um, his YouTube channel and his documentary in the show notes as well. So go to eolupodcast.com, look for episode number 310, and you'll find all those links there. Before we get started with our conversation, I want to mention if anyone listening to this interview and this podcast today is having thoughts of self-harm or has been contemplating suicide, please know that you can contact the National Suicide Lifeline at any time and someone will be there to talk to you. The number is one 800 273 talk T-A-L-K. You can also use the crisis text line and text the letters CNQR, which uh, Kevin explains is short for conquer, CNQR, to 741741. So that's CNQR to 741741, or the lifeline number is 1-800-273-TALK. And please remember, be here tomorrow you are precious. Uh, So we're going to move on into the interview with Kevin Hines. As I said, shorter than I would have liked, I could have talked to him for hours. Uh, But I hope that you get a lot of information from our conversation. And remember to stay tuned afterwards, and I'll come back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, Kevin Hines. Kevin is a storyteller at heart. He is a best-selling author, global public speaker, and award-winning documentary filmmaker. In the year 2000, Kevin attempted to take his life by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, but survived, and he will tell us that miraculous story today. Kevin now travels the world sharing his story of hope, healing, and recovery while teaching people of all ages the art of wellness and the ability to survive pain with true resilience. He's the author of the best-selling memoir, Cracked Not Broken, Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Temp. He's produced a documentary called Suicide the Ripple Effect and is working on a couple more documentaries we'll discuss and has a a brand new book that he co-authored that just came out recently called The Third Rail. in oh in my mania i became and you can learn more about kevin at his website kevinhinesstory.com so kevin thank you so much for joining me here today thank you karen nice to nice to meet you over the over the virtual zoom here Yes, I, I've been so interested in talking to you. Um, my listeners who've listened for very long know that my own father died many years ago by suicide. So it's a topic that's on my mind all the time, but I don't always discuss. And I, I'd love to begin, though, by having you just tell us your story. Absolutely, and I'm, and I'm glad to. Um, well, you know... In order to tell my story, we have to go back to the very beginning, right? Um, I was born to biological parents who, after they had me and my brother as infants, um, succumbed to drugs and alcohol. They had both been diagnosed, my parents, with manic depression, what we today call bipolar disorder, the very same brain disease I would be diagnosed with at 17 and a half years of age. And so my birth parents struggled to take care of me and my brother. And they lived in squalor. We lived in in and out of crack motels. These are the kinds of places you pay for by the hour. And if you don't, you're out. And they would leave us unattended to do score or sell drugs. And that's when a seedy motel clerk called the police. Hearing our screams and cries one too many times, he, he couldn't take it anymore. And the police came in with Child Protective Services and they took us into protective custody into foster care. Our birth parents would find us in the foster care system. They would kidnap us and go, for, go on, the, on the run for four weeks until they ran out of Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola and sour milk to feed us what they could steal. Uh, and we go back into the system. We bounce around from home to home. My brother and I get bronchitis and he dies. My only full-blooded brother. They say he looked exactly like me with blonde curly hair. If you know me, I have bright wavy auburn hair when it's grown out. And 
I immediately developed a severe detachment disorder from reality and abandonment issues that follow me until today. I bounced around from home to home, but of course, unlike my poor brother, I got very lucky. Patrick and Deborah Hines made me their son, and they gave me a life I could have never imagined with my birth family at the time. They gave me uh, hope and a future. They saved my life. Pat and Debbie Hines could have had natural born children, but they opted to take in three kids from three separate homes into one family and make a melting pot of a family. We didn't look like and people noticed, but we didn't care. We were happy. I'm mixed. Uh, my, 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 my family is from Jamaica. Uh, we are Jamaican, African, Black, Arawak, Indian, Portuguese, Scottish, Irish, English, and Sephardic Jew. Uh, my dad, that's on my mom's side. My birth father was half Mexican and half Italian, so I'm of a very mixed descent. My brother, uh, who Pat and Debbie Hines adopted from a different family, uh, is, is Black. My sister, who's from a different family, is white. And we, we, made, a, we made the Hines, the Hines clan. And, uh, you know, growing up, I remember we would be walking down the street with my mom and women would cross the street and they would be so callous and so prejudicial. And they'd say, excuse me, miss, where did all, how, how did all that happen? And my mom would, you know, reply very quickly and very aptly, oh, you know, all different fathers. And, you know, these women, <laughs> these women would just run ragged back across the street with their prejudice and, and their bigotry. And, and it was great the way she handled all that kind of nonsense. There were restaurants that wouldn't allow us to eat at them at night. And we just got up, went somewhere else and ate something else. You know, we knew not everybody would understand our family. So we didn't, we didn't allow it to affect us. Um, and growing up in the Heinz home, beautiful situation. Pat and Debbie Heinz worked tirelessly for everything they ever had. They, they earned it the hard way. Um, my dad, Pat Heinz, he had a really rough childhood. His parents, died of alcoholism very young, 49 and 54, leaving him with about $17 in his pocket to make his way in the world. And he put himself to the end of high school all the way through college. And he ended up becoming a federal banking examiner with the FBI, um, where he would go out, go, go around, and he would be the, the face with the FBI jacket on, shutting down Colombian cartels and Colombian banks in Colombia. And he, he would become one of the most prominent San Francisco bankers of his time. He would go from absolutely nothing to something. And he's the one that taught me how to write. He's the one that taught me how to speak. Um, and he, as in, as in public speeches, he would, be the, he would be the career day speaker at my grade school and high school. And all my friends were like, oh, your dad's so cool. You know, and uh, my mom, Debbie, 49 year nurse in San Francisco, has had every nursing job you could possibly imagine. She's just retired this year. Um, she, she started off at the burn unit in the trauma center at Mills hospital all those years ago. And that's an honorable profession. And they, they would work really, really hard to give us this great life. Um, and growing up, I thought, how can anything go sideways from here? I'm going to grow up. I'll get that good. I'll get in that good school. My dad's always talking about, it. I'll get that great job. My parents are always speaking of, and I'll be fine. But that's not what happened at 17. My brain broke. I had a complete mental breakdown in front of 1,200 people on a theater stage. Not one seat was open. And I ran out during the middle of the play that I was in as a lead. And the teacher had to come up and finish my performance. He was the only one that knew the rest of the lines. Um, and this was when my journey started, where I started losing people to suicide that I loved. Um, that same theater director of that show would take his life uh, the year of our graduation. And he was like a saying father figure to me. I love the man. And it was devastating. I remember driving to his funeral with my dad and my dad turning to me because I was already dealing with mental illness and I was seeing a psychiatrist and I was in treatment. But I remember my dad saying to me, Kevin, you would never do anything like this, right? Kevin, you can never do anything like this. And I was like, I, I remember saying to him, dad, I would, I would never hurt you like that. And, and at the time, I could never see myself attempting to take my life. Uh, and then two years later, oh no, pardon me, that, that year, the same year Mr. John Fennell died, that same year, 
I found myself on the Golden Gate Bridge walkway ready to jump off. And, and then I did. Um, and I don't tell this story very often, but I remember, I remember standing atop the Golden Gate Bridge walkway, looking down and thinking of John Fennell and thinking of the movie Robin Williams did, What Dreams May Come, and how he lost his wife in the, in the film, I believe, to suicide. And all he wanted to do was go into heaven or hell and find her and bring her back to, to heaven. Or, or I'm not, not sure the exact premise of the film, but it was, it was, it was, it came to mind on that bridge and I wanted to go and find Mr. Fennell and bring him, bring him back home. And then the voices in my head told me I had to die and I jumped, hmm. you know, and it, it was the millisecond upon free fall that I had an instantaneous regret for my actions and the 100% recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life and I thought it was too late. And I won't go into all the details, but I will tell you that there were a few things to save my life that day. A woman driving by who saw me go over who called her friend in the Coast Guard. The reason the Coast Guard got to my body within less than three minutes before I'd set in hypothermia was because of that phone call. A sea lion kept me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. A sea lion literally circled beneath me until I stayed afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived. Coast Guard saved me from the water. Ambulance got me to the hospital. One of the foremost back surgeons on the West Coast was there that day, opted to stay and do my surgery, performed one of the first and only surgeries of its kind. Uh, it saved me the ability to walk, stand, and run. 98% of those who leap off the Golden Gate Bridge never again get to tell their stories. The less than 2% that survive has been about 39 people in 85 years of that bridge being opened. 19 have come forward to say they all had the same instant regret that I did. 26 remain alive today, many have died of natural causes or old age, but only five of us get to stand, walk, and run. They call us the most exclusive survivors club in the world, and there's a book of the same name by Ben Sherwood. And I just have to say, I'm so lucky to be alive. I'm so grateful to exist where 20 years ago I should have died. And all I want to do with my life's work is try to help other people continue to be here tomorrow and every day after that. And I wanted to say you are doing that. You've devoted yourself during all of these years to that work, um, speaking, writing books, making documentaries. And uh, it's a, it's amazing. It's It's as if you were reborn in a sense it seems to me with a whole new life purpose you know uh, that's how I feel you know but you know people ask me all the time if I think this is what my purpose was and, I, and, I, and yes it is in a sense this is my purpose and I I've been given a second chance at life to do something with it absolutely but my purpose is also to be a great husband to my wife and a good son to my dad and mom, and a good brother to my sister and brother and my, and my birth brother and my birth sister, and a good family member to all those who love me, and a good friend to all my friends. So I, I believe, I don't, I ne I've never been a person that believes we all have one purpose. I believe we are multi-purposed. And if we can find out our how, then we can find out our why, hmm. you know? Yeah, that's such a good point. And I mentioned that I myself don't don't very often talk about suicide. I've talked about my own grief after my dad's suicide, but I still feel that this is a taboo subject in our society, which is why the work you're doing is so important because you're encouraging conversations just like the one we're having today. And and I wanted to discuss a little bit why why is suicide so taboo in our, in our society? Why is there such a stigma around it? In order to answer that question, you have to go back in history. Okay. So back in the, the, the olden days, uh, and I don't, I don't know the exact era, they would, if, if, if you took your life, they would put you in the fork in the road with a stake through your heart. And they would take your family's worldly possessions. And, and they would leave your family with nothing. 
Then you bring up uh, a, a great deal of the churches in American and worldly society. And they deem suicide to be a sin. And they did that because it depleted money from the coffers. The donations will go down because a parishioner wasn't in existence anymore. And so they made it a sin. Now, the Pope has since come out recently in the last few years and said that suicide is not a sin. People with mental illness are, mental illness is real and depression is real and they're not, it doesn't, but there's still a great deal of faiths that believe it's a sin. Um, and so there's a great deal of his, historical shame and guilt with thinking of suicide. When in reality, there are, I would say the majority of people in the world it's come across their mind some way, shape, or form. Um, and they're told that it's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. It's actually quite natural. When someone contemplates if their life is in pain, they consider taking their life. All that means is we need to teach them how to be self-aware so their thoughts don't have to become their actions. I live with chronic thoughts of suicide and have done so since my attempt in the year 2000, but it's been 20 plus years and I'm still here because I know my thoughts don't have to own, rule, or define what I do next. They can just simply be my thoughts. And when I have those thoughts, instead of holding them inside and burying them and silencing them, I unburden myself and I tell my wife, or I tell my psychiatrist, or I tell both, and I get to a safe place. So... The, the, the stigma, as you call it, or the discrimination or the shame or the marginalization of those with suicidal ideation has gone on for centuries because of these old world beliefs. Mm -hmm. we, have, we, have to, we have to bring this into the forefront and, and we have to change the way people think about the word suicide. That's so true. And, and I know that one, I mean, one of the only way we can change it is to keep talking about it. And yet I've, I've met many people who've told me they're afraid that if they talk about it and use the word suicide, it might encourage someone else to, to do it. And that it's almost better not to talk about it because we might give someone the idea who's experiencing a mental illness. And I wondered what you would say to that, that way of thinking. That is one of the greatest myths of our time. Talking about suicide statistically does not lead to suicide. In fact, talking about it in an educational, non-sensationalistic, hopeful way leads to people getting help, and it's the opposite of suicide. When you ask someone directly and bluntly and honestly, are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? And do you have the means? Those are the three questions you want to ask to someone in mental pain. And, and, and you want to ask your strong friends, too, that don't show their mental pain. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? And do you have the means? And if all three of those questions are yes, it's time to get that person to a safe place. But, but what that the, the crisis text line actually determined through their incredibly, uh, incredibly um, uh, new age algorithm that asking the question, are you thinking of killing yourself? derives a more truthful answer than are you thinking of suicide? Words matter and mm -hmm. language matters. And by asking the right questions, you could save a life. But asking either question does not lead to someone taking their life. It just gives them permission to speak on their pain and a pain shared is the pain halved. And, and that's just so true be, because suicide is still stigmatized in our society. Uh, people will may struggle to find the safety to talk about it or to tell someone the thoughts they're having. Therefore, they're keeping it all inside and dealing with it alone. And that's why we need to keep, we need to keep having these conversations and bringing it out in the open and facing our own fear of talking about it. And, and it's interesting that even I myself, I'm a doctor, but even I myself, I, because of the pain I experienced after my dad's death, I've had a really hard time talking about it, not wanting to relive the pain and re-experiencing it. But after so many years, I've, I've come to a point where I realize probably one of the 
gifts I could give now to my dad in a way is to be willing to just create a safe space and be more open and be able to have these conversations about suicide. Absolutely. And how, how, let me ask you a question. How did, how did you, how did you cope with your dad passing this way? Well, it, it took a, a lot of years. I was devastated for many years, but ultimately as a doctor, I, I made a career shift into working with hospice and working with dying patients because I, I recognize like I need to understand death and dying and grief better. I didn't know and, and I didn't know how to get through that. And so I shifted my career and it changed everything in my life. And so that's the work I do now, talk about end of life issues and oh, wow. and grief. And so suicide is a really important topic to include in all of that discussion, I believe. Yeah, yeah no, totally. And uh, frankly, I'll just be honest with you, a close family member has just been diagnosed with with, a, with, a, with cancer and we don't know the, prog- the exact prognosis yet, but it, it's terrifying uh, and, and, you know, this person means the world to me and it's, 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 it's hard to watch them be so ill and have no control. You know, there, there's, there's literally nothing I can do, but love this person and let them know how much I love them. Yeah. Um, I, I have no control over whether the cancer spreads or if it metastasizes or if it gets worse or if it gets better, I, I just have to wait and see. And I know I read that that some of the teaching that you do is to teach people how to survive pain with resilience. And that's a similar teaching to help people deal with grief and loss and even anticipatory grief when some that, someone that you know mm-hmm. is dying is that we rely on our resilience and whatever strength we've built up before to help us face these really challenging times. And so it sounds like you're going through something really difficult and challenging right now too. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating. I just read an article about the mindset of exceptional, exceptional cancer survivors. And it's about how the people who believe they're going to survive, survive more often than those who do not as it, as it pertains to cancer. And that's fascinating. Like your, your, your actual mindset the way you perceive your diagnosis, the way you, the way you, um, uh, the, the way you cope with it, um, and the way you, uh, your perception actually matters when, when you, when you, when you want to survive a cancer diagnosis. Um, but next to that, you know, uh, I've come to the point in my teachings where, where I try to teach people that pain is inevitable. It's coming for all of us if it hasn't already, but suffering is optional. It's a choice. And I say that and people, 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 people kind of balk at that. Like, what do you mean suffering is a, a choice? Uh, I've suffered with this. I've suffered with that. And people, every clinician I've ever been to, the first thing they tell me when they, when they're diagnosing me, and I've been triply diagnosed with bipolar type one with psychotic features is that Kevin, you're suffering from bipolar, you're suffering from depression, you're suffering from an eating disorder when I was, and uh, it was suffering, suffering, suffering. And I adopted that narrative, but that made me become the victim of my own story. If I instead believe that, that I was living with, battling, fighting, and surviving and thriving with my disorder or struggle or condition, that's when I would become the hero of my own story, never to suffer a day in my life. And I always say I've been in pain since the day I was born, but I've never suffered a day in my life. And, and you, you know, it, it, that's really about perception and perspective. If I look at it and I hold gratitude inside my pain, I know I can always survive it. And that's what I teach people is that if you want to be truly resilient, you have to hold gratitude everywhere, not just, not just for the good times, but for the bad times and the struggles and the, and the strife and the, and the, and the true uh, uh, dark times, if you will. Mm, wow, that's really beautiful, and and I love that. And it, and it, as I'm saying, it applies really well to people going through any type of loss or grief or you know great challenges and difficulty. And I I wanted to ask what you thought of this as, as I looked back on my dad's suicide, and I've done a lot of. Um, investigating in a way about his life and what the factors might have been that contributed to his suicide, it occurred to me that the 
the pain of being alive for my dad was just too great. It was yeah. so much that he was bearing and yeah. that it overpowered his will to live or his joy mm. of living. And um, that that's why he ultimately made that choice. Just the, the pain of life became unbearable for him. And so I, I, I wonder if this fits kind of with what you're saying um, for other people in great pain, if we're able to help them find a way to be with their pain and to still find joy and still find gratitude, maybe we can can help bolster the will to live and help them cope with whatever pain they're experiencing better and, and just to be there as a support system for them. I'm in total agreement with that. You know, you know, it, it, it's, it, if you can help someone in pain, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental, or all of the above, recognize they still deserve to be here until their natural end, then you can help them cope with that pain and you can help them survive it. And we can all be conduits for people to change their life. We can all be conduits of telling stories. Because if you tell someone your story, they're going to tell you theirs. It's just the way it works. And stories are 22 times more memorable than facts. And there's an art and science to the storytelling. And when you tell your story in a way that involves hope, healing, and recovery from, from your pain, you inspire other people to go recover from theirs. And that's what I've learned in this journey is that I've traveled the world 345 days of the year, sometimes for the last six years pre-COVID and sharing my story like that. And thousands of people will stand in line to, to tell me their story. And I'll wait for every single one of them uh, to, to get to their story. And I'll be there till, the, till they close the building if I have to, because, you know, they're, they're the type of speakers that go and are just there to, to be seen and make a buck. And there are speakers that really mean what they're saying and what they, what they want to instill in people in pain. And if you're, if you're one of those types, then you wait for the people who are going through it and you hear them out um, and, and you hear their stories and it can be heartbreaking. It can be devastating. It can weigh heavy on you after the, after the event, but it's important, you know, and um, you know, I, I, in doing this work and I'll just segue into this, if that's okay. In doing this work, I, I got to meet uh, Jesse Cohen who you mentioned in the beginning um, with our book, The Third Rail. And Jesse was, was filled with life. And he was uh, an excitable person. And, and you could tell that in his bipolar disorder, he had mania that was very present. And sometimes it was hard to deal with. But his light was so powerful that you, 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 you still wanted to be around him. Um, and... Tragically, Jesse would lose his battle to depression by way of suicide. But he would leave us as we wrote this book together. We didn't, it wasn't finished when he passed away. We, I finished it with his lovely wife, Mari, his widow. Um, and the third realm of many I became um, has become a beacon of hope for people and something that will show you the real truth behind manic highs and what they can do to you. Jesse became, uh, Jesse in his, in, in his 20s was a Tulane law student who uh, was in Louisiana during the height of the organized crime era in the 1990s. And he just was so sick and tired of police corruption. He was so sick and tired of um, the dangers of criminals in that area that he would go out in a, a black suit, black tie, black shirt, and black shoes, a baton, and some weapons, and he would become a vigilante. He was like Batman. He would go out and he would use a police scanner to find criminals and to thwart their attacks on people. And he would leave them for the police. It got him in trouble with the law. It got him in, in the psych wards. He, he was just living inside this mania all the time. But this book, it really goes to show you what it's like to live in mania, how to overcome it, and how to stay alive from suicidal ideation. Um, and we've already had messages from people saying that this book saved their life. So I hope that your audience can find hope in this book and, and find light in it because it, it really was a pleasure to be a part of writing it. I miss Jesse terribly. He was the second to last person I've lost to suicide. I've lost 11 people to suicide that I love. Mm. Um, and Jesse was two years ago. Um, but his, his message in this book is crystal clear. Be here tomorrow. You've got this. You can do this. And suicide is not the answer. 
And I'll leave a link to um, to that book, The Third Rail, and also to your other book, um, uh, Cracked Not Broken, Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Attempt. I'll leave those in the show notes. But I know we wanted to mention, you said something about the crisis text line. Um, people can text anyone who's maybe having suicidal thoughts or dealing with that in order to get help. So would you tell us about that? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. So if people text CNQR to 741-741, the crisis text line, they'll be with a crisis text counselor within seconds. Um, And uh, that CNQR stands for something. It stands for courage to talk about your mental health. N stands for normalize the conversation. Q stands for ask the questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life or do you have the means? And R stands for recovery and I'm living proof. And so CNQR, what it means is conquer, conquer your pain. And you can use hashtag conquer pain on when you post online with that. But, but the crisis text line is a, is, a, is, a, is a great tool for people. Put it in your phone, utilize it. It can help you. But there's also another great tool for people who, uh, who need more immediate help. And that's the Not OK app, N O T. Okay, app, and you can you can you can add in opt in five friends or family who who if you press one button on that not okay app, and you you've basically sent a message out saying you're not okay and you're in need of help right away, it sends your location to those people, and and basically says you know you're in psychiatric need or physical need, um, and the, the they get they they they're your personal peer protectors and they get to you in, in minutes to uh, seconds to minutes. And, and you, it, it also alerts a, a cri- the crisis text line. So it, it's, it's a fantastic way to have more control when you feel you're out of it. You know, it, it allows you to um, be your own personal protector. Um, and I, I, it, it was created by these two young students um, a brother and a sister team and the sister had a terrible debilitating fainting or blacking out disease. Her, she would have these brain issues and she'd black out. Well, she, she had this feeling or this sensation that it was about to happen. And so she presses the not okay app and her brother was in the same school and he'd come running, you know? So uh, just a, a fascinating tool for so many people to utilize, whether they're in physical need or, or mental health need. Well, oh, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to leave links for all of these resources. I know you have to go because your time, your, your time is really limited. Just one last word I'm wondering for people like me who've had someone die of suicide and who are carrying a really big burden of guilt mm. around the deaths of our loved ones. Do you mm. have any hope that you can give to us about how we live with that pain of someone we love dying by suicide and, and wondering if we, we could have done more for them. I do. I do. I absolutely do. A, it was not your fault. Never was, never will, never can be. Number two uh, is, is this, we have to stop asking the question why people died by suicide. It's an unanswerable question. We must begin to ask the question, how do we look to the living and move forward? Um, You know, I don't believe we can move on from a suicide. I don't believe it's possible. I don't believe some people can move on from deaths in, in general. Moving on is very specific. I believe we can look to the living and move forward. And those are two very different things. And if you can celebrate the life of someone you lost to suicide on their birthday, with family and friends who love them just as much as you did with birthday cake and a candle. And you're on that day only allowed to talk about the good times. Imagine getting into a room or a house with however many people you deem necessary that love that person and only sharing good memories for two hours. How healing would that be? It would turn the tide on the way we cope with suicide. And Of the 11 people I lost to suicide, I've celebrated all their lives. And it helps me heal because I don't ruminate in the pain. I remember 
the times they lived their life to the fullest and how beautiful they were and forever will be. Wow, that that's truly beautiful and inspiring to me, Kevin. I have goosebumps right now. And I know you have to go, and I just want to thank you so very much for everything you're doing. Um, and I'm so grateful for the, the miracle that allowed you to still be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Nice to, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, too. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Kevin Hines. Uh, as you p could probably tell at the very end, when I asked Kevin for any thoughts he would have for people like me who have survived the suicide death of a loved one and have been carrying around with us tremendous feelings of guilt after the death of a loved one, um, you probably could tell I was very moved by Kevin's words, which made a big difference to me. Um, the fact that he said, you couldn't have changed it. It's not your fault. So you have to free yourself of that guilt. And which is something that I've been working on for a long time. But I just had the realization recently that I actually need to practice self-forgiveness. And I just wanted to tell you that that's coming. That is coming up in the next episode on my What Really Matters podcast, a whole episode on self-forgiveness because that's my new project that I'm working on. But anyway, I also loved it that Kevin said instead of focusing so much on the manner of my dad's death and how it happened and when it happened and all the pain and all of the grief and the suffering to use my dad's birthday as an occasion to celebrate his life and the joyful, positive times we had together and all the positive things I want to remember about him. And that really touched me. I found that to be very sweet. So I just wanted to say this, my time that I spent with Kevin, though it was short, was very powerful for me and helped me uh, do a lot of healing and come to terms with some of what I have carried inside of me for quite a long time. And so uh, Kevin is a, he's an amazing person. And I see why he's getting thousands of letters from people around the world um, whose lives he has changed and made a difference in. And so um, though he's dealing with his own mental health struggles, he's out there every single day making a powerful difference in the world. And what an inspiration. How amazing is that? And so I wanted you to know about Kevin and his work. I hope that you'll kind of learn more about him, get involved, go to his website, watch his videos, and spread the word and let other people know he's a fantastic speaker to include in any program that you're putting on or to recommend if someone is looking for a speaker, because it's essential that we start talking about suicide in this open way and, and really discussing it and um, hearing stories about it and sharing with each other so that we're no longer keeping suicide locked away in the closet in, in silence with a negative stigma in our society. And this might be how we not only help some people make the choice to go on living, but also help everyone whose lives have been impacted by a suicide death to also recover and to also heal some of the pain that they've been carrying with them, like me, for years and years. So uh, thanks for joining Kevin and me today for this episode and this interview. And I hope that you will take this information and use it in your own life, you honestly never know when you might encounter someone. And one thing that Kevin reminded me of, which um, didn't make, we weren't recording at the time, but he said, remember, it's always okay to go up to anyone and say, are you okay? Is there anything I could do to help right now? And so he said, any time that you see someone who looks like they might be suffering, don't hesitate. Just go to them and say, are you okay? Is there anything I could do to help? Because you might save a life and you might change a life just by simply asking those questions. 
So I'll be back next week with another interview. If you find this content beneficial, I hope that you'll share it with someone else who might also gain something from listening in. So feel free to share any episode or tell people about the podcast if they haven't heard about it already. Uh, they can listen on any, po any platform where podcasts are airing and encourage them to subscribe and then leave a review. And I hope you'll do that as well. Uh, leave a review and a rating if you enjoy listening, because that'll help the podcast rise up in the rankings and be shown to more people who are searching for this kind of content. And you will be helping us to grow this community of people who care about end of life issues and want to see everyone have a, a natural, healthy, peaceful, dignified end of life. So until next week, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear. Be ready for whatever happens next and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.